Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Please note that all attendees during the main portion of the program will be muted and we will be monitoring videos. Should you have any technical issues during the event, rest assured there will be a recording. For optimal viewing, please make sure you are in speaker view, not gallery view, which can be found in the top right corner of your screen. If you're interested in learning more about Jewish National Fund USA, please reach out to any one of our JNF Future Professionals or Michelle Rabinovich at rmrabinovich at jnf.org. If you have any questions during the main program, please chat them to JNF USA. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Michelle Rabinovich and I am the new JNF Future Prof Professional in New York. I just wanted to thank you all for being here to support Jewish National Fund USA. We are constantly thinking of our brothers and sisters in Israel, and now more than ever, with over 2,900 rockets having been fired into Israel, it is so important for us to come together and be there for them. Wishing you all a Chag Sameach. Hello everyone, and welcome to Shavu is Cooking with Jake Cohen. My name is Sarah Armet, and I am the JNF Future New York Affinities Chair and National JNF Future Board Member, chairing National Conference in Israel 2021. I have been a part of JNF Future for five years. I have been fortunate to travel to Israel multiple times with the organization, leading a food, wine, and culture mission in 2019. I hope that you enjoy our event, and if you have any questions about anything you hear today, please feel free to contact our professional from NYC, Michelle Rabinovich, whose email will be in the chat. For those who aren't familiar, JNF Future is the young philanthropist community in Jewish National Fund, USA, ages 22 to 40, dedicated to engaging and energizing young leaders who are committed to environmentalism, community development, and building a brighter future for the Israel of tomorrow. We are the fastest growing community within Jewish National Fund USA. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Firestone and I'm the missions chair of the JNF Future New York Board, a proud member of the Go North Task Force and a high society donor. Being involved in Jewish National Fund has inspired me in so many ways, especially when it comes to the incredible work JNF is doing in the Galilee. Before I introduce you to the reason we're all here today, we wanted to share a short video of the Galilee Culinary Institute by JNF USA, the state-of-the-art culinary school pioneering the Israeli food scene. Directed by renowned chef and, master, and spice master Lior Lev Sakars, the Galilee Culinary Institute will bring the entire greater Kiryat Shmona region to life through food, agriculture, technology, employment, education, and tourism. As the first of its kind multifaceted learning approach, in the culinary arts in the Middle East, the Institute aims to become a center for immersive culinary experience, innovation, and experiences, not just in cooking, baking, food science, food technology, and agriculture, but also in restaurant and hospitality management and the business of food security. I'm super excited to be sharing with you our upcoming culinary academy with the Jewish National Fund and myself in creating a, a unique international culinary center in the Upper Galilee in Israel. Not a cooking school, a full-blown culinary arts school where you will learn everything about culinary arts from the front of the house to the back of the house, from food security to food technology, from inventory to bookkeeping and accounting and running your own restaurant. Our students will be trained by top professionals and celebrity chefs that will be coming. And we will turn the Upper Eastern Galileo to the culinary capital of the world. Stay tuned. cookbook author and a nice Jewish boy from NYC, a former food staffer at Sabor, food editor of Tasting Table, restaurant critic of Time Out New York, and editorial director of The Feed Feed. 
Jake wrote his first book, Jewish, about his love of modern Jewish cooking and baking. When he isn't contributing to outlets like Food Network Kitchen, Food 52, and Food and Wine, he's posting collaborating videos and recipes on his Instagram and TikTok, at Jake Cohen. He lives in New York City with his husband, Alex. Hi, Jake. Welcome. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. We're so excited to have you. Are you ready for some Shavuot cooking? Oh, we're ready. Happy Shavuot. Love it. Okay, so today we're chatting really always about um, dairy and like the whole idea of like symbolism when it comes to Judaism is super, super strong. Um, I think when it comes specifically with this holiday, obviously commemorating, we're getting the Torah and one of the parallels is we eat a lot of dairy because of this idea that like the nourishment that we get from Torah is similar to the nourishment that we get from milk. Um, and typically I, I think you know, lots of cheesecake, all that stuff. But um, today we're going to be all about schmear, obviously bagels, cream cheese. I'm in New York, which is the, the JNF future tri-state. We are in probably the bagel capital of the world, if not the universe. So um, we're going to be making two recipes from my book that I love to have on hand when I go do like any type of bagel party. And that um, starts with pickled onions. We're going to make some like really easy coriander pickled onions, which I think are like my favorite way. Obviously, like freshly thinly sliced on red onion as a must on bagel, but I prefer them pickled. You can do you. And then we're going to be making the charred scallion cream cheese from my book, which is just a really nice way to kind of amp up like what you're smearing on your bagel. To me, it's really like just something I love to keep in the fridge. So shall we get going? We're going to start with the pickle, uh, pickled onion brine. So I have my little counter cam too, which is what's coming in over here. So you'll be able to see everything. Um, we're going to start with a cup of distilled white vinegar. Really, there's not like a ton of things that you have to be sticking to key. You could like play around with it. We're going to start in a small saucepan on stove. And I think we'll be able to show that too. Beautiful. Okay, so one cup of vinegar, one cup of water. Let's say you don't have distilled vinegar. You could use white vinegar. You could use red vinegar. I want to do something like balsamic, but like anything that's neutral, rice wine vinegar would also work. Go wild. So we have equal parts of vinegar and water, and then we are just going to add in a quarter cup of sugar. Seems like a lot, but like most of it's just going to stay in the brine. We just want to add a little bit of sweetness, which I think is perfect whenever you're doing like bagel stuff a tablespoon of salt. Then flavorings. I'm doing two teaspoons of coriander seeds. You can use whatever spices you like. If you love cumin, you could do the cumin. You could do chili flakes if you want a little spicy. You could really just kind of like raid your pantry and your spice cupboard. Go wild. I love coriander to me. I just think it's just like really lovely and floral. Um, I think the pairing in pickles is like ideal. So I throw this over medium high heat. We're just going to let this dissolve. The key part is, is we want to get all of that salt and sugar incorporated. So we can then pour it over our onions. I've got one red onion that I thinly sliced. To me, it, it's like, it's got to be red, but that being said, any allium is really going to do the job. You could use shallots. You could use, like, a sweet onion. Um, now, obviously, it's spring. Like, if you happen to get your hands on ramps, you could do this with ramps, pickled ramp bottoms, not the greens. The greens would actually work really well for the schmear. Char the greens for the schmear, and then you save the bottoms and pickle them for, uh, um, for throwing on top, which is a really great, like, spring way, since Shavuot is obviously corresponding with ramp season this year. Um, so let me also say that throughout this entire process, any questions, throw them up, throw, come at me, whether it's about the recipe, literally anything. I'm very good at multitasking. We're not, we're not this isn't brain surgery. We are making pickles and schmear.
Hello. Hi, Hello. Jake. Okay, we have a All couple right. of questions for you that we can ask while you're cooking. Amazing. Rachel, cool. can I begin because I have a question? Yes, please begin. Hi, Jake. Hello again. So <laughs> Hello. fans want to know, what inspired the cookbook, Jew-ish? How'd you come up with the name? Yeah. Um, the inspiration really is like, my husband and I started hosting Shabbat, which is something that neither of us actually did growing up with our families. Um, but as soon as we started doing it as a couple, we really fell in love with it. Um, we did it through an incredible organization called One Table, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. I'm on their board now. Um, and it was really the first time where we felt like we were given permission to kind of take our own Judaism in our own hands and help dictate what that was going to mean for us. And a huge part of that was food. And while we were falling in love with Jewish ritual, it became this opportunity to start to explore the Ashkenazi foods that I grew up eating, but had never cooked before. And all of the Persian Iraqi dishes that my husband grew up eating um, that I had never had or made before. And then as we started doing it, I, I quickly saw that this was something that I really wanted to explore um, as a uh, as a book, as, as a real like resource, not only for, for others, but for also myself. In terms of the title, to me, I have a lot of fun with it. I think it's, it means different things for different generations. For our parents' generations, I think people love to still identify as that, as Jewish, as a way of the secularization of our community necessarily would correspond with being labeled as a bad Jew or being Jewish as being less Jewish, um, which is something that like people always say. It's like, my book is called Jewish. I am Jewish. No hyphen, hard stop. But the way that I practice Judaism, the way that I cook Jewish food, it doesn't look the same as it did back in the shtetl, and that's okay. Um, and I think part of this book and this journey is coming to terms with the the ish aspect. It's a funny pun, and it's also something in terms of, I really hope it inspires people to uh, take what they want and really dive into the meaning behind all the symbolism and so many of our rituals and leave the things that might not work in for their lives. Awesome. I love that. So kind of going into your response there, how do you really come up with the recipes? What's the process like in terms of you know, developing all these recipes. So they were literally all done at, um, at Shabbat dinners. So I tested every recipe in the book and developed them at Shabbat's because to me, it wasn't just creating delicious food and recipes that work, but they had to work in the context of hosting. The idea of Jewish hospitality, I'd say is probably the center focus of this entire book. So I wanted people to be able to make a menu of recipes from my book and not feel like they were losing their mind or that they were overwhelmed. And that was truly at the beginning of, of what it was. And then from there, it was like, what did I want to serve for dinner? What did I want to serve for Shabbat? That's awesome. Thank like, you. Before we go to the next one, we're going to go back to the counter cam. <laughs> so what's mm. happening? We have um, the pickle pickling liquid, everything dissolved. And now I'm just pouring it over our onions. And that's literally it. And now we just let it cool. It's it, like I said, really anyone can make this and you can do this with truly like the sky's the limit. You could do this with cauliflower. You could do this with broccoli. You could do this with any vegetables you love. This pickling like will work um, and it's super great. So now that that's gonna set aside and get cool, we can throw in a few more questions and then I can get smearing. Jake, I gotta give it to you. Those are the most aesthetically pleasing onions <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> so, as I mentioned before, Jewish National Farm uh, was founded in 1901 and has planted over 260 million trees in Israel. Israel is my home away from home. We want to know. When was the last time you visited Israel? So I was there in 2019. I was supposed to be there in 2020. Unfortunately, because of COVID, I wasn't able to. Um, so hopefully I'll be back later this year, potentially, hopefully, if not next year, but I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I'm cordially inviting you right now to join us in, um, Israel for our national conference 2021. More info soon. Love it. Rachel, Love it. Rachel, 
I'll kick it to you. Perfect. So what in the, in the cookbook, what's your most popular recipe? Do you know? Uh, it, it, it changes by the day, especially uh, by the holiday. For Passover, the most popular recipe were my macaroon brownies, which are cake for pay, and those were huge. Like, even the fucking, um, uh, uh, Jess Seinfeld was making it for the Seinfelds, and, and like, the, just seeing how many people made it was insane. Um, now, I would say the challah, people bake that every Friday, is really exciting. I love that. Yeah, your hall looks amazing. I do need to try it. Yes, I believe every Jewish person needs to know how to bake a challah. I think it is crucial that everyone takes the time and it's meditative and it's super important to understand the reasoning behind it. And it is a vessel for connection with others that everyone should be making. Very true. All right, Sarah, do you have one more? I got, oh, I got another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite questions, actually. And it came into the chat, so I think it's only appropriate I ask it. You're trapped in a desert island. I asked Lior Sarkaz this one, too. You're trapped in a desert island. What are you bringing with you to eat? It's always matzo ball soup. That's truly oh, like, and, and it's, it's just, that's it. I have that every day and be happy. There's never a day in which I'm not a King Kong soup. Good answer. So that, that's it. That's <laughs> I love it. All right, why don't we jump back in to Schmear. Um, scallion cream cheese. I feel like everyone loves it. Everyone has it for their spreads. What I started doing is I started like adding, wanting to add more flavor. And obviously you can do that a few ways. You could throw in a bunch more things like spices or different ingredients or alliums like garlic and leeks and all this kind of fancy stuff. But then I wanted to kind of just simplify it and be like, what is a way to take a classic thing that everyone loves, put a little more TLC towards it and make it a little better. And to me, it was like, why don't we char the scallions? And we're not looking to really cook them, but we're looking to throw them in a super hot pan, get a little bit of color, what this does is it adds like a hint of smoke from the charring, as well as like a little bit of sweetness from the onion. So you get like so much more flavor. So still it's just scallions and cream cheese, but it tastes like you put in a lot more work than you actually did. And that's my favorite way to cook. I just think that that is how everyone needs to be thinking is less so about like less is more. Just putting in the time, the care. So many recipes in my book are like not crazy in terms of ingredient list, but more so just like learn how to do things correctly, season things properly, cook things properly. And people are going to be more impressed by that than some kind of dish with a million ingredients and all the bells and whistles. So I'm heating up a cast iron pan over high heat. We are looking for like high, 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 hot, 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 because we want to just have our scallions to be kissed by a little bit of like searing hot pan, and then we're gonna pull them out. I'm throwing in a tablespoon of olive oil, and I have four scallions here. Depending on the size of your pan, you can keep them whole. I cut them in half just to make myself a little bit easier, um, but it's something that I, I, I think that you really don't have to get too precious with. You could use a lot more scallions if you have them. You could don't have that many, you could use some scallions and then you throw in some chives or you got a leek or you got, I don't know, anything. They're really like, they're, the sky is the limit. I, I really believe that people should get creative and they should take their recipes as this baseline to start to understand what they're doing and then make it work for your life, for your taste, for your, your everything. I have too many picky eaters in my family to know that like there is no like one size fits all when it comes to a recipe. And I feel like people should know exactly what they're doing and how to really pivot. So let's just see. Are we hot enough? Yeah, we're good. So I'm throwing in my scallions. Make sure it's nice and even. You want to be hearing that popping immediately. And I'm just going to let these sit, not touch them for about 30 seconds really start to get some color and then we'll toss them up to get them on the other side. 
the other key thing, cream cheese. There are a bunch of things to know. Like, obviously, I grew up, I'm, an, I'm a tempty boy. My husband literally goes through so much tempty. Um, whipped cream cheese is great to me. I don't think it's crucial. Um, the most important reason why is take out your block, have it at room temperature. So I took this out first thing this morning. And that way you can really whip it up and incorporate some air. It's going to be nice and light and fluffy. And you don't have to like spend extra money on whipped cream cheese, which is like just exactly what you're going to be doing yourself. If you're going to do the mix-ins, just use regular cream cheese. So again, we're just looking for little streaks of color. Keep it going. But we don't want it's like let it get army green, let it cook down until it will. We don't want slimy scallions. We want it still to honestly be pretty much crunchy in the middle and just have some color on the outside. That is the goal, and you'll only get that if you have a really hot pan. That's why I love cast iron, because it conducts heat really well. So you can preheat it, throw it in, one and done. And then you can take this as far as you want. Another thing that would be interesting is like you could definitely add in some garlic. If you would like spice, you could throw in a jalapeno and char it up or any type of chili. Really like go wild. Anything that's going to add a little bit of smoke, kind of like you're making salsa. But we're doing it with schmear and stuff. All right. So I'm going to turn it off. Nice color. Not crazy. Just a little. Kiss, kiss with smoke. Kiss with caramelization. I'm going to pull it off. And throw it right onto a cutting board. And we're going to let it cool. We're going to do a few more questions while I let that cool. And then we can slice it up and assemble and chat all about bagels and the type of bagels and all of my thoughts on assembling bagels. <laughs> that I want to share with the group and you before I ask my next question. A little question. I started chocolate company in COVID. I never cooked before, so this can inspire people who are on this who've never cooked and they're going to try Jake's recipes. I had a flavor. It was called the Upper West Side, Schmear Today, Gone Tomorrow. So I thought Love. I would share that. So it leads me to my next question. Jake Cohen, you are the authority. What is the best bagel place in New York City? So my bagel today is from a classic that I enjoy thoroughly, which is Bagel Boss. Um, I love, love, love Bagel Boss. I grew up with it. Um, that being said, there are a few that I really, really enjoy. I think in the new realm, Gertie's, which is from Melissa Weller, the same baker who did the bagel program. Um, did all the bagels at Gertie's, which are incredible. I do love Russ and Daughters. It's more of a classic, small, original bagel versus the new age, which are like big and fluffy. And I, that's the kind of bagel I want. Um, and then I love Essa Bagel. And locks. <laughs> Where are the best locks from? Russ and daughters. Russ and daughters, but actually, like, I'm especially now that I live in Long Island City, I'm a quick bike ride away from the Acme um, warehouse, and I think Acme smoked fish is just incredible, and they make this. Um, they have great locks, great Nova, but they make this thing called salmon candy, which is like smoked salmon, and it's like it's like covered in maple, and it's like. I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like like lox jerky, and it's become my new favorite thing. Like I like it more than lox. Wow. That's awesome. Okay, another question for you from the chat. Is there a cast iron skillet that you recommend? If some of us... Yeah, so I mean, I, this one right here is Le Creuset, which I like. It's a nice kind of like entry-level great size. I think everyone needs like really four pieces of equipment in their kitchen. And that's, this is what I go through them. One, here, I'll show you my, you can go, go so you can see my stuff. I always have it up. One giant Dutch oven, my big Le Creuset, one 12 inch cast iron skillet. Um, and then you need like a big pasta pot and a nonstick skillet for everything else. And those are the four things that I use the most. 
and everything else I have. I have like eight Dutch ovens, a bunch of different types of pans of all different sizes, but really like those are the four things that I, I'm always grasp, grasping for. Oh, that's so helpful. Thank you. It's something to, to really like, you just gotta be, you gotta think about, you gotta think about like, what do you do? How do you cook? And that's the key part. All right, I'm gonna be moving the camera over so we can see a bit more of the, um, the action of what we're gonna be doing. So I have here are scallions. I'm just gonna rough chop them. It doesn't have to be perfect. I like to keep it rather chunky because I like kind of big pieces of scallion. And then you could kind of go through it. You could technically do this in a food processor if you really wanted to like get it incorporated. But my thing is I just hate more dishes and that's what that would create. We're just gonna rough chop it and throw it in a bowl with our scallion, with our cream cheese and get stirring. And this is something that always tastes better like the next day. So if you really want, like it's great, like fresh, but it's so great the next day because the scallions really can incorporate. Um, cream cheese has fat and fat is where like all of this flavor kind of gets really in like, incorporated that is a kind of incredible vessel for aromas and for so many things that we like don't know how to verbalize that makes something delicious that's why like your your grandma's brisket always tastes better the next day any type of braise is the same thing okay In the frame, throwing in eight ounce block of cream cheese. Room temp, it's got to be room temp. If it's not room temp, it's not going to incorporate well. And then I'm just using a rubber spatula and I'm just gonna to start to like smash it until it's all combined. And then I'm really gonna to start to stir it with some like violence. And this is because we are trying to incorporate some air. And that's how you're gonna get a nice fluffy light cream cheese versus something that's like heavy and dense and the lighter it is the more you can eat and not feel gross <laughs> well, of course gonna come in nice little pinch of salt and pepper you could season this up however you want if you love like a little tang throw in some lemon zest or lemon juice if you love some spice you could really go hard on the pepper throw in chili flakes um if you love it like super um allium forward you can put in some garlic powder which would be really lovely to add in a little more like bite to it there is no right or wrong answer it's just uh, how you like your bagel but now that we have this and we have our onions it's really good wow um yeah i love schmear here are onions you see in just the, the little bit of time they've gotten this beautiful fluorescent pink color which is just like when i talk about building a bagel if this is something that not only like is so delicious and makes everything taste better and you could use this on everything like this is this is going to be enough for not only your bagels, but then you save it. You put it on your in your salads. You could use the pickle juice for your dressing. You could use this on nachos, on like grain bowls, really like falafel. Anything, anything, anything will be good with pickled onions. Like I've literally, I rarely find something um, in terms of the dinner category that's not improved the pickled onions. A little bit of acid, a little bit of sweetness. That's really good. Okay, so bagel. We chatted a little bit about what it means to find a great bagel in New York. A key part of that is it's got to be fresh. I do not believe in toasting bagels. I believe in having fresh bagel and just 
eating them, <laughs> really, to, to put it put it quite simply. And not just because like a really like fresh bagel is going to have a nice crust on the outside, it's going to be nice and fluffy on the inside. That being said, not everyone eats all their bagels at once. And then what I'll typically say is then you can toast it. Or I'm a big believer as anyone here who has a, uh, a Jewish mother, a Jewish grandmother, the number one question I get at every virtual thing I've done for this book, every single one, the first question, can I freeze it? Which is every, every Jew loves, loves, loves to stock their freezer with everything. <laughs> and bagels make no difference because my mother always had at least a dozen bagels in our freezer growing up. Um, and to me, the trick is with that is it's a kind of a two-step process. You microwave it covered for like 30 seconds to a minute until it's soft. And then I split it open and toast it. And that's typically like when you're looking to refresh a bagel and make it kind of taste like it's as good as can be in terms of not having it fresh. That's like my preferred method. But I'm gonna grab my bagel, serrated knife naturally. I have many thoughts on, on like assembly that people get angry about. I don't, I'm not huge on like tons of schmear. Like the, I think people put too much schmear at the shops and it's like, I just never want, like at Essa Bagel, love their bagels. They put like an inch of cream cheese. Like that's not, that to me, that's that, that's that's kind of anti semitic Like to have that much dairy, it's not good. Not, not, not good to have that much dairy in one sitting. But um, I do, also stand by like, you shouldn't be scooping your bagels either. I think the, the insides are the best part. Um, and then I think the pro move is like the order in which you assemble. So we're starting with schmear. I love capers. Love, love, love capers. There we go. I'm putting it back before I'm making it. That being said, you don't have to do capers. My polarizing, but I think they're really good too often. And I would just have this conversation with the people at um, Call Your Mother when I did an Instagram live with them is people put the capers on top of the tomatoes, which is like just uh, it's careless. You have to put the capers on top of the cream cheese, cream cheese is the sticky stuff. So, this is how you're going to have it so that the capers don't fall out everywhere. We don't want, we want everything to end up in your mouth. So, then you could kind of like press them in. Boom. I'm actually going to go for my, the, it, it kind of depends on how you're doing it. If you're doing an open face or closed face. Um, today I'm actually skipping on the locks just because I, I don't know why I just wasn't feeling it. I've like, sometimes I've just, I've been just really into like tomato onion schmear, no locks. So that's what we're doing today. So I'm going to do the, the pickled onions first, same reason because they're going to stick in. And then I have some beautiful beefsteak tomatoes. We're getting into heirloom season, which is like my favorite time. Boom. Key part is, is that whenever you do your tomato, I go in with a little flaky salt. You gotta season everything. Do a little pepper. Season, season as you go. Obviously, if you like really salty locks, then then maybe maybe you can skip. And now I'm just gonna throw on. This is another thing. Some people love it. Some people don't. I love fresh dill. And then to me, like this is breakfast or brunch, or lunch, or honestly dinner. Like there are times where I'll eat this all time of the day. But this is like my ideal of, of how you really step up your bagel game. As long as you get a good bagel, put some care into the schmear, think about how you're seasoning, have all of everything, but also like make people do it themselves. I love a bagel bar. I think that's the most important thing is like make everything, have it out. People can do their own thing. And if they don't want to like do it the way you do, God bless. Like that everyone is has their own weird bagel combos and I'm no different. So shall we shall we go back to any more questions, any more chatting while I while I snack? We got a lot <laughs> more questions. Um, you were the king of Shavuos. 
I, I know that I will certainly be talking everyone's ear off tonight at my family dinner about you and your schmear. Um, so many questions coming through. The first one on right now is people want to know which um, which recipe in the Jewish cookbook they should start with if they really are a self-proclaimed, just awful chef. Um, I would say the one that's been really popular that I love is the Iraqi roasted salmon. To me, it's like one of my favorite ways to make salmon. Super easy, but it's just like, it's going to open your world to new flavors. So what happens when you start to focus on like spice and acid and everything. So, so go for that one. Sounds good. Another question that came through in the chat. Um, for the scallions, is there a reason you sauteed them before cutting them instead of cutting and then sauteing? Yeah, it's or just it, 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 it just becomes too much of a mess because the more you slice it, the less surface area, well, more surface area, the more liquid that's going to come out. So to get a really great sear, you really just have to have them whole. If you slice them up and throw it into a pan, they're going to sweat. It's going to take a lot longer to caramelize and they're going to turn into mush. So really, like, that's why in the pan, then chop it up. If you go crazy, throw it in the food processor and just pulse it until it's together. Oh, so smart. Thank you for that insight. No worries. So the next question, I'm a little bit intimidated, comes from a Culinary Institute of America alumni and ex-line chef. When you're working in a restaurant, you really only taste one bite of something at a time. But when you're working as a home cook or recipe tester, I love people who are recipe testers, clearly that is different. How does your relationship with judging your own cooking change, change when you moved from working in a restaurant to working in a test kitchen to developing your own cookbook? Um, you have to rethink everything. It's like rewiring your brain. It really is something where you just have to, there's so much attention to detail in restaurants and that doesn't change, but also there's this new lens of who, like who's making it, who's your audience. And in a restaurant, the same way that you think about who is your consumer and what are people looking for when they come to that restaurant and they're ordering a dish, you have to now think about who is your consumer as a cook, as a home cook. And what is this recipe doing for them as a service? Is this something that they know it's going to be a lot of work, but it's a, a project recipe they want to do? Is this something that you want someone to be able to do any weeknight? It, these all become variables that you start to think about. So as you're tasting everything, as you're thinking about development, that just becomes the first thing in this conversation. And then from there, it's like, how can I make the most out of this so that they have the best experience and want to make this dish every week. Oh, I think you. there's one more question. Um, if you don't have a cast iron skillet, like we were discussing before, can you use a regular frying pan or will it, will it mess up the no, it's fine. recipe? It's, no, that's fine. Okay. Use whatever you, whatever you got. Diane. Okay. Just want to double check. <laughs> I, have a, I have a couple of questions. So many just keep coming to mind. What restaurants are on your list right now to try in this summer, now that everyone's out and about again? Like where, where is on your list to go? It's mainly just going back to all of my favorites. Um, I'm going, I love, I've already been back to Miss Ada, which is my, one of my favorite Israeli restaurants in Fort Greene in Brooklyn. Going to Oxamoco tomorrow, one of my favorite Mexican restaurants in Greenpoint. Um, Loring Place in Gramercy in uh, Greenwich Village is like the best. So I'm going there in two weeks. Mm, not a ton in terms of new. I mean, new-ish. Like I, I love Edith's, which is a new kind of bagel shop in, um, um, in now Williamsburg was Greenpoint. And yeah. Uh, that is kind of whatever. I, I don't, I'm not looking for fancy. I'm just looking for like all of my favorites back. And do you have any plans for a pop-up or a restaurant um, coming soon to New York City? No, I have no interest in any of that. But 
I do love doing a lot of partnerships and collabs. I just did one with Bread's Bakery, um, which was kind of Shavuot-ish, where we did um, they did a version of my tahini cheesecake from the book. We did a pop-up at Gertie's, where Melissa Weller was making some recipes from the book for their menu. Hopefully a few more of those. I'm going to be in South Beach next week doing dinner, actually, with Lior and Adina Sussman uh, for the food festival. So, so things like that, a little low lift, not nothing, nothing, nothing wild. Well, you must tell Lior that we all send our love from Jewish National Fund. Of course, of course. <laughs> okay, I think we have one more question regarding the scallions. People are very interested. Yes. Can you grill the scallions instead of hundred percent? You got to grill. Go for it. It's the okay. same. It's the same idea. Same right. same idea as grilling them. High heat, quick, like color. Actually, it's not common to, it's not uncommon to pe have people grill scallions and then chop it up and throw them into vinaigrettes or dressings or chimichurris. So this is kind of that same Ooh. idea of just adding some smoke and some, some sweetness, but just for our application for scallions. Amazing. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions from the group? Pop them in the Zoom chat um, if you guys have any more questions. I know that the number one piece of advice that I will carry with me for the rest of my life is that um, the order in which you apply the capers. Who That's it. That? I mean, it's, it's all simple. ergonomic. The main thing is whether you have it, I'm, I love open faced. Some people love the sandwich. Either way, like you just got to be thinking about what's going to make the the environment as clean as possible, because there's nothing worse than like a sandwich where it just falls out completely. Like to me, that is that's that's the worst. That is the worst. Function. 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 Yeah. Function over passion. <laughs> yes. I think it's safe to say that I'm officially obsessed with Jay Cohen, as I'm sure everyone else on this Zoom call feels the same way. I love it. I mean, I think, I think like I, I kind of touched upon in the beginning, one of my favorite aspects of Jewish food and exploring Jewish food is so much of these dishes have become so tied to our ritual, but through the lens of symbolism. And I think the focus is always on like, all right, well, we eat dairy for this. Oh, here are kosher for Passover desserts. Oh, here's this, the apple things for Rosh Hashanah. But we never focus. It's never covered in the magazines, any of those things about the why. Why do we do these things? Why um, is this a symbol? Why? And, and when we take religion out of it, it's just typically comes down to symbols of hospitality, symbols of community, symbols of family, symbols of um, of just setting intention and gratitude. And when you look at it, it's like, it's just all really beautiful motifs for food and um, and what they can represent in our day-to-day -day life. And just adds a little more depth to what we eat. Love that. Okay, we have a couple more questions before we end for the day. Um, Jake, is there one dish that you prefer to eat out versus cooking yourself? That you can think of? Yes. Um, pickles. But it was just it was something that was oh. like, I, a lot of questions like, why didn't I put a pickle recipe in my book? It's because I think you can buy incredible pickles and I don't think anyone needs to be like lacto-fermenting at home. I don't have counter space for like <laughs> jars of cucumbers. So um, that's one of those things. And in terms of the other end of it would be a, other breads. I don't think that, I don't need to be baking sourdough. I think I can get some incredible sourdough at incredible bakeries across the city. That makes sense. But Hall is <laughs> Yes. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite knife manufacturer? Yes, I love Zwilling. Zwilling. I use all of the Zwilling the the Zwilling Hankels um, knives, which are German, because I they they just feel good in my hands. Some people love Japanese knives, um, and I have plenty of Japanese knives that I also love, like Miyabi. The only thing is, like, they can sometimes be a little too small and I'm just like bashing my knuckles into the cutting board. Thank you. 
And in regards to the salmon jerk you mentioned before, do you eat it plain or you put it on the bagel? Is it too chewy for the bagel? No, you put it on the bagel. I've used it in my my uh, everything bagel galette. It's really good. You really can oh. use it for everything. Oh, good to know. We'll have to try that out. I have a personal question. Do you have a salmon yes. mousse? I do not, but that sounds like... Jake, it's next up. Maybe you'll name it after me. Sarah Salmon Moose. Love it. Love it. I mean, that's the thing. Everyone has, has that recipe, that family recipe that people are tied to. Yeah, well, maybe we'll connect and we'll share grandma's secrets to the best salmon mousse you ever had. Love it. Okay, so I'll go back to the script of the questions that people have coming in because it's not about me, it's about all of you. Where can people find the macaron recipe, brownie recipe that you mentioned that you do for Passover? In my book. Amazing. Perfect. Oh, and where is the best place that you buy pickles? I mean, I just think any grocery store, you can get some really great, pickles. like, oh, okay. Really great. There's the pickle guy. Like I do love a good farmer's market, like a, like a mm -hmm. jug of, of pickles, but really I see like a lot of like, a lot of local New York people are selling at most of the fairways and Whole Foods, which is always great to see. Got it. Amazing. I think we just got one more question. The last question of the day before we close out, what has been your favorite part of the cookbook writing experience? Seeing people make the recipes and not just like one recipe, but people are like cooking their way through the book. And that's obviously the most rewarding. And I think it's, I think too, very often, like we, we have conversations um, within the Jewish community and it's um, typically it's, it's, there's a little humor involved of things or people or, ideas and it's always divided into good for the jews bad for the jews and to do this book which is really about celebration of jewish identity and have something that really is in the category of good for the jews um that means a lot i love that that's such a great way to end our last question jake this has been truly incredible i know that so, i'm very grateful him on and we are all very grateful that you sacrifice your Sunday to be with us. Thank you, Anytime. everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Please, please check that. Please check the chat. I'm sorry. Please check the chat for ways that you can stay connected with Jake through social media, his website, and his new cookbook. We will also send all of these links in the follow up email. We hope that you enjoyed this amazing cooking session with Jake, and we are wishing you all a Chag Sameach and happy Shavuos. We also wanted to remind you that if you, have, that if you make a new gift of $1,000 or more between now and May 23rd, you will receive a signed copy of Jake's cookbook, Jewish. And if you make a gift of $360 to $1,000, you will be entered into a raffle to win a cookbook. Lastly, don't forget to mark your calendars for our next event. Join us for JNF Future Presents Pride in the Frontier on June 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, where we will learn about JNF affiliate Macomb and what life is like for the LGBTQ plus community in Israel's frontier. For more information on our upcoming events, keep an eye out for our monthly JNF Future email. You can stay up to date by going to jnf.org forward slash on demand or by following us on social media at JNF Future. Thank you and have a great rest of your Sunday.